Uh, good evening uh, to everyone who's joined us for this, uh, what, what promises to be a, a really, really interesting session today. Uh, and we've titled this session, Technology and Social Impact, Forging New Realities to Empower uh, Women Entrepreneurs. And we're today gathered uh, with uh, an amazing power pack panel of women to talk about the power of technology and its ability to drive uh, impact, uh, both uh, in terms of ventures and in, in driving social impact. And over the last one year, uh, we've seen the role of technology just uh, step up uh, in uh, forging communities and in, in bringing people together. You know, talk about technology and social impact and how technology can help forge new realities uh, to empower women and entrepreneurs. And uh, this is a panel discussion that is brought to you by the Better India. And as Lenovo, we're very, very proud uh, to be a part of uh, this initiative. My name is Amit Doshi, and I'm uh, the Chief Marketing Officer at uh, Lenovo South Asia. And uh, some of you may have heard uh, me talking about how technology has played a really, really powerful role over the last one year and everyone's experienced it. But today we're, we're here to talk about something that's uh, I, I, what I believe is gonna be far more enduring, meaningful and, and powerful uh, and, and will last, uh, last uh, for many years to come and which is to explore the power of technology and how it can be leveraged to empower a self-sufficient ecosystem for, for women entrepreneurs. Uh, from fighting uh, gender disparity uh, to enabling penetration of good quality education for, for everyone uh, and, and many more stories. We have uh, a group of women who've really showed us the way in the way they've used uh, technology. And today what we're really talking about, of course, is, I mean, the pandemic is in our face and how it's accelerated transformation in every sector right from education or how technology is adopted but but it also comes with an extremely lopsided uh, where there are a lot of uh, people in our country who are still who still don't act, have access to technology and and there is that gap between the haves and the and, and the have nots and and that's one dimension i would love to touch about uh, in in the panel and finally we want to explore this whole relationship uh, which is a really interesting one between technology and, and gender and, and how can technology help bridge this disparity and, and, this, uh, and this gap which exists. So that's, that's really what we're here for. And uh, with that in mind, uh, let me introduce uh, my panelists. And, and I consider myself extremely lucky to be uh, the only male moderator here. And, and I hope to pick up uh, a, a bunch of lessons. To begin with, uh, uh, let me introduce the youngest member uh, of, of this panel, uh, Jyoti Tyagarajan. Uh, Jyoti is the foundation of uh, Mekshala Trust. Uh, Mekshala Trust is an organization that is focused on improving the quality of education, especially in government schools, uh, Pan-India. Uh, today, Mekshala Trust uh, empowers a network of almost 18,000 plus teachers and it's uh, managed to create a tremendous impact in the education sector and continues to uh, do so. I mean, talk about uh, social impact using technology and especially in the education sector, uh, we couldn't have uh, had someone uh, better than uh, uh, Jyoti to represent that cause. Uh, from uh, Jyoti, let's move to Brinda. Uh, Brinda Purnapragna is the CEO of Evidya Lok. Uh, Evidya Lok is a not-for-profit social enterprise that leverages technology to reach education to everyone in rural India. Today, Evidya Lok uh, delivers uh, to over 1 million uh, children learning hours in seven Indian languages through 1,000 uh, plus volunteer teachers. And what's interesting is that these 1,000 volunteer teachers who teach uh, who, who delivered more than a million child learning hours remotely come from about 180 cities across the globe. Uh, and they're touching lives of more than 15,000 children and uh, their families in close to 200 villages across 11 states in India. Uh, amazing, uh, amazing story. 
And what's special about, uh, again, Brinda's background is how she chose to move from an extremely successful corporate career uh, and made a conscious choice to move into the social sector and, and uh, demonstrate impact. Welcome, Brinda, to the panel. Thanks, Amit. And uh, from Brinda, we move to Rose, Rose Gassler. Uh, Rose uh, has joined us uh, from uh, from the United States, so it's it's a bit a bit of an odd time uh, for her to join. But uh, the, she's as part of India as it gets. Uh, she came to India from the States uh, in 2012 uh, with a Walker uh, Fellowship from Hendricks College. Rose began to work with an NGO that uh, uses girls' team sports, very, very interesting flavor, uh, as a platform for women empowerment and social development uh, in rural India. Uh, she's based out of uh, rural Jharkhand uh, in a village called Hutup that's just outside of Rachi. Uh, and I specially identify from that place, Jharkhand is my home state. Uh, and, and this story is a really special one. Uh, she's the education director at Yuva, uh, and, uh, and and you know as as Lenovo in, in the past we've been associated with Yuva, uh, and it's amazing to see how uh, this team of uh, football playing girls have uh, and some of them have grown to go through college and just uh, given themselves a very very different life. The other interesting thing about she's also an ultimate frisbee coach. I must pick up notes on what is ultimate frisbee. Uh, and uh, she's the founder and principal of the UA school, which uh, leverages sports to empower underserved uh, uh, young girls. Uh, welcome, Rose. And from Rose, uh, we move to Monica Yadav. Monica is an engineer, entrepreneur, and therefore doesn't come as a surprise that she's also a STEM educator who founded uh, Respire Experiential Learning, a platform that designs curriculum and develops application-based uh, products for making STEM learning easy. And if I reflect back on my school days, Monica, I could also do with uh, that curriculum today and, and possibly cover on, on massive gaps that uh, school education left. I'm also a vocal advocate of gender equality. She's uh, actively working on an initiative called Girls Do Science which is an educational toolkit to encourage girls uh, in the age group of nine to 17 years to take up, take up STEM, uh, to take up STEM. So really, really powerful story there. And from there, we move to a Shiro, uh, Sairi Chahel, who is the CEO and founder of, uh, a lot of you would know, Shiro's, which is a community platform for women that offers support resources, and interactions via their platform shiros.com and the shiros app uh, her approach to solving problems and especially the ones around gender disparity in india have directly impacted the lives of more than a million women uh, and uh, she's got an amazingly ambitious goal uh, to reach over 100 million uh, in the next five years so more more power to you sairi and welcome welcome to the panel and I'm, I mean, as I went through the introductions and I was referring to my notes, I, you know, I, I'm just getting goosebumps, uh, uh, getting, you know, my, uh, head, wrapping my head around the impact and the accomplishments that you've been able to achieve. So with that, uh, I guess let's get started. Uh, so the first one's uh, coming at you, Jyoti. I mean, now this has been said, 2020 has really changed the world as we, as we knew it, uh, especially in the education sector. And we all know what the new normal looks like, uh, which is which is learning uh, online. And you've been absolutely at the helm of it when it comes uh, to driving this effort in India. What do you think? How, how can we efficiently drive, uh, use technology, leverage technology to ensure that quality education reaches absolutely everyone? Hi, everyone. And hello. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind um, introduction. Um, you know, every time uh, I think of 2019 and, uh, you know, unknowingly we stepped over the new year into 2020, uh, I think of what Churchill said, you know, he said at, somewhere around 1940, he said, let no crisis go to waste. Um, and we were bang in the middle of a crisis uh, in 1920 and I mean 2020. And um, it takes leaders to convert a great crisis 
into something that could be an opportunity. And have we done that? I'm not entirely sure, but the time is not lost yet. It is time, you know, it is time to actually gather our forces and maybe this is our time to make a huge change. The one thing that I'm always aware of is that while we change everything, we, we change our clothes, we change our, um, our houses, the way they look, we change um, our tech, we change our cars. The one thing we've never changed is our educational system. You know, I mean, why would that not change? Because isn't that what actually drives uh, our paths into the future? So uh, look at what happened. We were standing there like, like a deer caught in headlights, uh, when suddenly we had the tech to take us to Mars and we had an edge system that wouldn't even lift off the floor. Uh, how do you put these two things together? You know, and remember that we are looking at an old age education and a new age tech. And most people, should, we should, like most people, we should have used this very special time to actually change our education so that it would actually uh, serve the future generation and not keep washing the past. Um, so it's not, it's not a secret, we all know this, that emerging economies, especially the global south or whatever we call it, the third world countries, they've never actually looked at their education patterns and said, does this serve our needs? Will it give us the opportunity? And what kind of problems does it have? I can speak for India. India's biggest problem is the sheer scale of the problem, the sheer scale of the number of kids out there, you know? And tech brings to scale, uh, literally tech, tech brings scale on a plate. You know, if, if we have a good, if you have good tech, then scale is taken care of. But we must stop to think and say big solutions come with big problems. You know, and once you let the problems go offhand, then uh, how do you solve it? A simple, a simple example is the water closet. You know, we, we made a water closet to keep our bathrooms clean, and now we have a, almost an entire planet filled with water. That is the problem, right? And we mustn't let that happen to education. Um, so scaling, we must build a safety net for scaling. Um, and as we go on, I'll tell you more about what exactly we do, and perhaps the questions will get some more. But this, uh, so this is a cautionary tale. You know, I, it's a it's a perfect moment of ability of uh, enterprise, and it's a perfect moment where we can take a step wrong um, and make a real mess of it. So we take it as we as there is a sweet little saying in South Africa: softly, soft catchy monkey <laughs> so that's what we have to do yeah thank you jyoti and and from that uh, from there let let me move to brinda and uh, while all of this uh, was happening in fact even before the pandemic struck evidya loka was already using technology to bridge uh, the gap uh, and the lack of teachers uh, in the country and with the pandemic uh, how do you see this problem of uh, teacher shortage and if i Recall it right, I remember you and I have spoken about it. Official figures are like what a million uh, teachers short, the, the country short of a million uh, teachers. How do you see this gap panning out with the pandemic? Do you see it uh, increasing, decreasing? What, what's going to change and what kind of technology innovations are required to ensure that everyone has access to technology? Uh, and especially in, in remote areas where you work, uh, who you work very closely with. And, Tell us, tell us about what, what have you been able to do uh, to drive this uh, change. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. And I'm happy to be here on this forum. Uh, the pandemic really um, has, in a way, uh, enhanced what we've been doing so far, right? You rightly mentioned that uh, we've been doing and facilitating this online education of supplementing the teacher shortage over 10 years approach. And this, and this then kind of catches unawares, right? We just kind of shifted gears. What we did really was to enhance the teaching which happened in the classes to a program which we called as Learn From Home. We started teaching the children through with the mobiles available 
in the community with the parents, with the siblings, etc., ensuring that the classroom now went from a classroom to a device, actually, right? So that happened. And then apart that, we also started to do this multi-mode approach of teaching children through television. We engaged with uh, the cable TV operators who were there in those uh, local, regional, villages, districts, and we have sure that the children did not lose, lose out in uh, learning. So that happened. So when I see was 2020, the pandemic year, uh, did it kind of impact us in a way that we stopped what we were doing? The answer is no. Did we become more innovative? The answer is yes. Uh, did we reach out to children um, through facilitated sessions with the community team that we work with, with our network partners, leading it from the front and ensuring that the children gathered in to learn? We did that, right? And most important, when we also look back, and I kind of recollect what you asked, Amit, is there a technology gap? Um, I'd say probably it's the economic disparity. Um, if the state, when I say state, it's the government or organizations um, help in procuring these devices and making it more a leveling field, I think everybody can be enabled. So it's not the technology, it's more the economics that we have to kind of be cognizant of when we say that, that everybody has a right to learn and thereby the state or any organization should facilitate the disparity to get reduced and thereby every child can learn. Do we have the access, the framework, the proposition, the teaching methodology, the so, so empowering and visionary volunteer teachers to do all this? The answer is yes. Program, we have, a, we have the teachers and we get the technology through these means, the child can continue to learn. So, so that's been my observation of the last year. Uh, and apart from saying that we do teach about uh, 20,000 children every year, Amit, and uh, the last year we've been about 50, 60% of those children have been continued to be with us through this multimodal approach that we've taken. Um, and we've had multiple other programs that we launched. So, yeah, it's been um, a year wherein we reinvented ourselves and we built on our strengths. So that's my submission on it. No, that's fabulous. And what I find uh, extremely uh, interesting is how you leverage volunteer teachers. It's yes. one to uh, work with uh, professional teachers and yet another to, uh, and kudos again to all the volunteer teachers who found time in the middle of so much that was happening in their own lives. I agree with you. Share and contribute uh, to others. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And and uh, the, the fact that technology is that glue to make that change and how you use creatively uh, is, is very, very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brinda. Uh, let's, let's, uh, move, let's change tracks a little bit. And, you know, uh, uh, both uh, Jyoti and Brinda are uh, driving enterprises which empowers teachers or empowers individuals to teach. And uh, Rose has actually taken a very, very different route to get uh, to get kids to school, to get them engaged at learning, to get their families to uh, support learning for for uh, their kids, and especially in uh, where where there's a lot of stigma, where there's a lot of gender disparity, and we're talking about uh, one of the most rural areas of India uh, in in the state of Jharkhand, and uh, Rose and her organization have used sports and specifically the game of football in a cricket mad country uh, to transform lives. I mean, how amazing can, can a story get over to you, Rose? Just share, share with us your stories and, and experiences. Sure, Amit, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so first, I would just like to, to point out that the, as I'm listening to my, my fellow speakers here, a big difference between their organizations and UA is that UA is extremely small. Uh, Jyoti was mentioning that one of India's biggest challenges is, is just the scale, the fact that there are so many children in need of education uh, throughout, the all, throughout India. And in Yua's case, we run a school that has 100 girls in it. It's quite small. Our football program has 600 girls. And so we often are asked, why don't you scale? Why is it so small? Why don't you spread this everywhere? 
So I think I, I would like to address that first. Uh, so to understand Iwa, we are focused on enabling vulnerable girls in rural Jharkhand, in this one specific area of rural Jharkhand, to break out of poverty permanently, to take their futures into their own hands. And what we've seen after over a decade of working in this same community is that in order to do that, it involves, it, it requires a very intensive holistic program because many of these girls are coming from such, um, such vulnerable backgrounds. Their parents are illiterate. As Amit mentioned, there's a huge amount of, of gender disparity when you look at the lives of girls and the lives of boys. Most girls are married off by age 15 or 16. And in order to help these young women to radically transform their lives, you really need a program that's very deep, that has that depth, that has uh, that intensity. And so that, that is what UA delivers. And we believe that by investing deeply in girls so that they can become young leaders, they are the ones who are going to take that scale into the future. We believe that they will become leaders and they are becoming leaders who will then go on to affect change in terms of gender equality, in terms of poverty reduction. And we've had incredible results uh, just focused on this relatively small group of young women. So we run a football program for girls and they, these teams, I, as I mentioned, there's about 600 of them. They come together six days a week, year round. And we always ask the teams, how often do you want to practice? Every time they say every day. And the team, they become what I like to describe as self-help groups. They, uh, they're a place where girls can feel safe, where they come together with their peers, when otherwise they have a relatively isolated uh, existence just in the service of their families. And then we also run life skills workshops. So once a week, every single team in UWA has a workshop where they sit down, they, they're not running around playing, and instead they have a discussion or an activity where they address different topics that are important, such as health or rights, uh, future planning, financial literacy, technology. And then finally, we, we run an all-girls school. And this school is, is very focused on leadership. It's very focused on preparation for higher education and for careers. And um, just to share a few of our success stories, uh, we had our first graduating class last year, which was a bit devastating because they had, we had grand plans for the first graduation ceremony and, and like so many students across the world, they really were robbed of that, that experience. Um, but just to share one, one story, uh, there is a, one of our graduates named Nita. She's from a family of six, um, five daughters, one son, and Nita's the second youngest. And all four of her sisters were for, forced into child marriage. Um, Nita joined Yuwa when she was very young, became a player, became a coach, joined Yuwa when she was in Yuwa school when she was in eighth standard and had not had English previously. And uh, over those, those years, she was able to develop so, um, so much confidence. She had the support. Uh, she was able to bridge this, this gap and she was actually accepted to Ashoka University on full scholarship and is currently there studying. And uh, we like to tell her story because when you look at her family, her future should have been very um, clear. It should have, you know, she, if she had followed in the pattern of her sisters, she would have gotten married quite young. And I could go on and on, Anita's story is not the exception. Um, but as I was saying at the beginning, we believe that these young leaders are going to bring that scale in the long term. And Rose, how do you see the role of technology and how have you used technology uh, creatively in, in this uh, process? Any, Great any question. examples of that? Perhaps? Absolutely. So our school is, is very focused on technology and on ensuring that every student has access to that technology, knows how to use it, and 
um, knows how to use it in a way that's going to prepare them practically for higher education and for careers. Additionally, we have about 40 young coaches who are the ones leading all of these teams in UA. Every one of those coaches has a smartphone, usually that they've purchased themselves with, uh, with money that they earned from their coaching. And then using their phones, we are able to track um, all sorts of uh, data about the football program. So attendance, we now conduct all of our coaches meetings virtually, which is not ideal, but, it, but we are able to do it. And it's because uh, these coaches have become so savvy with technology, they know how to utilize it. And so with a lot of, um, with a lot of mentorship from our staff, uh, the young people in UA are, are using technology and, and growing with it. Great, uh, thanks, thanks. That's, a, that's another really inspiring story. Uh, Monica, let's, let's uh, you know, let's move the mic to you. Uh, now, Brinda, Jyoti, everyone spoke about the fact that, uh, you know, there's economic disparity. And when you get go to rural areas, it's like a double whammy. You have economic disparity and far greater gender disparity compared to, uh, uh, to other parts of the country. Now, when you put both of them together, you know, that's a, that's a really complex problem to solve. How do you think in, in your head, uh, what are what are solution areas? How can technology be used creatively? And especially, how have you been able to use uh, technology to uh, move your uh, move your ambition on on STEM education for for all girls? Thank you, Amit, and I'm very glad to be the part of this panel. Uh, for me, I would say that technology is very different. So when we say technology, uh, we talk about e-education or we talk about online classes. But for me, it also comes to be how do we uh, get these kids do robotics, AI, and uh, you know all that includes in their STEM education. What are the futuristic technologies we are supposed to introduce to these children, primary children? Now, coming about the data, uh, when you say that, uh, what is the gap? So 28% of females, like it's likely that 28% less females will have the mobile and 56% of less their internet ex uh, accessibility. So this data shows that if we are trying to do the online education for a year, it's girl students who are going to miss out the larger part. And in rural areas, so like when we work in Rajasthan, uh, most of the parents are not agreed to give a mobile phone to young girls. Uh, there are cultural uh, issues as well and there are uh, they'll always prefer that if they have one mobile in a uh, family we have convinced people they'll give it to a boy and not to a girl so we have been like taking calls speaking to parents and it has happened so systematically how are so the point is that this is a cultural part right that girls are not given mobile phone the accessibility of internet is not there but then the solution has to come from the system we cannot be relying on the only on the stakeholder of parents and community only. You know, there have been so I largely work with government and uh, state government and CSR companies. And it, it is my belief very largely that we have to bring in a systematic change. So, for example, we established STEM lab. It's a very uh, like, you know, we call it maker lab. Somewhere we call it Kalpana lab. And we have done it in KBVP, which are the special girls school. And uh, these are very low cost lab, which has accessibility to everything. So it will have it will have tablet. It will have e-content. It will have all the DIY kits. It will have shouldering guns. It will have robotics. It will have, uh, you know, a, a coding uh, program into that and computers as well. We established that with the help of government, but this is a very infrastructure intensive project. And this is where we want that uh, it should happen. It should come under a system rather than only giving the responsibility to the community holders. We cannot burden because there is an economic gap, because there is a even buying a mobile phone or even buying a robotic kit for a girl child or even for a child might be very difficult for a parent in rural area. So it is an onus is on the system to bring in an accessibility to all these kids. And we have to make sure that the transparency, so there have been a lot of tenders, there have been a lot of new uh, education policies. So we have to make sure that we invest on crafted solutions for our rural schools. 
we need to largely invest on that new education policy have been slightly focusing on it but it is it is the onus on government after this pandemic that how do we start investing on education and crafted technology solutions for kids because what is working in city area is not going to work in the b, uh, b or c tier cities so we need to bring in those solutions infrastructure wise so if we speak about we have to develop we have to promote entrepreneurship we have to promote a lot of social enterprise where these people will bring in infrastructural solutions to this case and making sure that it is been largely supported i'm sure brinda and jyoti would agree on this extensive teacher training you know because nothing is like giving a computer in the classroom without teacher training is not going to help so we need to invest more and more on services and services investment uh, by government is very less so we need to look at the part and this have to i believe that this has to come from a system rather than putting in the onus on the community and the parent got it so i mean your view is to get a more structural solution yeah, sure. to it which is going to be far more uh, enduring yeah. uh, so so great uh, you know some some very very interesting dimensions from everyone and i want to just bring them all together uh, and and therefore uh, direct my next question to sairi and maybe even uh, put her uh, in a spot can technology indeed uh, address uh, gender disparity and if so how uh what do you think are are the big changes that it can drive right so first of all very nice meeting all of you i was feeling so inspired listening to all the stories uh so i think um so before i really answer your question let me tell you a little bit about how how my view got formed and uh, and i think it's still being formed but uh i i grew up in a place called muzaffarnagar which is you know be a popular place after all but um, and he used to live away from the city and you know this is obviously pre internet age and our newspaper would come at 2 o'clock you know because somebody had to go to the city pick up the paper and so i think uh, what i really know is that access to information is is a form of privilege you know and i think thankfully that barrier is breaking down like you know i was a bookworm as a child and you know we could only buy books when you know somebody came to delhi or somebody visited you know us from overseas or whatever but i think uh, and of course since then uh, you know a lot of things happened in my career one of which was uh, getting to build an internet company very early on in 99 when nobody was building internet companies and nobody was sort of talking about consumer tech here but my view is very simple that we are a country with you know the the largest gender gap you know every time that big list comes out we are 140 out of 156 uh, we have some of the poorest ratios of women in workforce numbers we have a lot of these social challenges but you know we are also the country with the best digital payment stack in the world we are also the country with uh, you know with 700 million smartphone users so i think uh, that's really the trigger idea in my head to say maybe technology can't fix everything but can it build a few bridges at least like to me i think for somebody who did an mphil and phd with you know with those uh, cards those cards you make notes on and then reference them back and now you know having to sort of literally you know uh, build this whole ecosystem online uh, i can see that see that pattern you know and uh, and of course we all know that uh, we all know somebody in our family who got a smartphone a couple of years ago and is now like you know really living it up and like overusing it because i think they making up for that time but uh, look i the other thing about internet in india is that we uh, we 700 million users women are late entrant 5 years ago when i started shiros there were only 10 million women online in india today that number is almost 300 million maybe if you shave off the one time connected connected users it's still 150 million 200 million women connected to a device and i think there's huge power in that um uh, and the lot of work we do is very simple our assumption is that uh this can break a lot of barriers maybe not all barriers but it can break a lot of barriers and what we really do is uh we're building a safe space for women on the internet and we are taking a leaf from the offline playbook we are the country that has self help groups and uh, uh seva and microfinance and you know organized women only groups have existed and succeeded in india 
beautifully. So we're literally plucking that model and saying, hey, now everybody's on smartphones, let's do this in a new way and let's make a safe space. And what that safe space does is, one, it just automatically increases your confidence. If you don't have to watch, watch your back and you, you don't have to look down and walk, it changes your gait, right? It changes how you feel about yourself and it changes everything about you. So she is a women only space. And what we really do is, uh, uh, one, it's a space for expression. I can share whatever I like. I, I, can, I, can, I can put out content that I can't possibly share with my family or I can ask questions that I'm looking for answers to whether it's health or legal or career or parenting. And then, uh, uh, you know, you can do a lot on the platform itself. It's a, it's a rich social network. So you can bring a lot of your life to it. And, uh, and what that does is it adds a little bit of that emotional progress we are all seeking. You know, we all seek it in different places, but a lot of women in India are you know, they're invisible in their families. They're invisible in their neighborhoods. They're literally mom and wife and daughter. You know, they're, they're like Sri Devi from English English, right? Like till such time she's cooking and going about without bothering them, it's all good. And, and the other triggers for us of uh, using technology is uh, 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 employment, gig work. So I think as a company, uh, for seven years, we've been talking about remote work until COVID happened. Nobody sort of really paid us attention. Our sales cycles used to be like six months long. And now, now, you know, everybody knows what is remote work and all of that. Uh, there's entrepreneurship. And when we say entrepreneurship, it's really micro entrepreneurship, literally somebody with a device and a UPI saying, what can I do with it? Can I sell my uh, Madhubani paintings? Can I be a yoga teacher? Can I be an influencer? Can I be a reseller? There's so much happening there. And now uh, the third and the most significant pillar is access to capital. In my head, it's it's a big shift. Just for a day, just imagine switching off your internet and your smartphone, right? Like you don't have data and you only have a feature phone maybe. Uh, you know, our life would feel so barren and it'll feel so, so sort of stuck. And and that's the difference. I think it's not not solving all problems, but it's what it's doing is it's creating a trigger and that trigger has a network effect uh, that's going to last a long time, you know, and it's only getting accelerated with adoption of, you know, digital products and services. Oh, wonderfully put. And I took away access to information, access to capital and, and jobs, and more importantly, access to uh, emotional safety. That's, that's, uh, that's an angle that uh, I'd never thought of. And, and that, uh, that uh, brings us to a very, very interesting juncture. Uh, in in our discussion, I mean, I I uh, I'm uh, I'm feeling glad that's a cause that uh, as Lenovo we've also taken to really drive. And uh, while our vision is smarter technology for all, uh, one of uh, the the one of the most uh, important causes in our set of things is education. We believe that education uh, uh, is everyone's right. It it should be accessible to everyone. Uh, we work with uh, at least three of you here uh, in very, very uh, deep partnerships, and uh, we learn from each of you every day. So education is is clearly right up there. Great. So uh, that uh, get that that's a great segue for us to move into the second part of the discussion, and we'll we'll uh, maybe double click on some of the things that you said uh, in in the first uh, part of this discussion and let's talk about let's skin the skin the problem a little more so let me start with jyoti uh, jyoti uh, you've uh, worked with educators and you're you're relentlessly working on getting technology to uh, getting a, them to be technology savvy and be also in the situation that pandemic through uh, you've used technology really really creatively but having seen it all, what, what do you think are the challenges that educators still face in India when it comes to getting more technologically savvy? And, and what is the role that the community at large, whether it's the civic society or uh, corporate uh, or, uh, or, or the government, uh, the policy can play to, to make that acceleration faster? You know, I can say that teachers come into our program not being tech, tech savvy yet um but you know the greatest pushback we get is not from technology because guess what we've had a we've had a town crier walk ahead of us 
WhatsApp. Anyone who uses WhatsApp is not going to be a techno uh, pusher backup. You know, so um, we are good with our tech acceptance. What is difficult is to change people's minds on how they should teach. But you know, if we step, if we wait for that to happen, you can be sure that we are all moving inexorably towards tech. Okay, um, I'll tell you a very quick short story about this. We walked in into a new group of teachers who had never seen us before, and we handed them a tablet that was wirelessly connected to a projector. And we said, so if you switch this on and if you marry these two, then uh, you'll get the picture on so you can use that uh, to explain everything to the kids and the lesson rolls out in front of you and you can add, subtract, whatever you want to do to the lesson, but it'll give you a hint of how to teach the lesson. I walked in literally 17 days later into a classroom of a teacher who asked me, for me later on in, on day one to say, how do you turn this thing on, did you say? And I remember my heart bounced on the floor. I thought, well, <clears throat> she doesn't even know how to turn this on, but we, we're going to fight this. Uh, on day 17, I found two kids at the board. The projector was pointed at the board. I miss know it all. I thought, why, why is she pointing the projector on the board? And then I looked closer. The kids were projecting a problem on the board and they were working out the problem with a stick of chalk on a wooden board on a sheet of light. I mean, if you had told me on day 17 on my first teaching assignment that I would mix media like this, I would have laughed you out of my classroom. If I had a classroom on day 17, that is. Um, but this teacher who didn't know how to turn it on had progressed to this level. Then I noticed that the, the lesson had something written on it. So I thought, oh, that's careless of us to have put up a slide that had something written on it. But no, it was the kids worksheet. She had figured out that she could take a photograph of it, project the photograph and get the kid's friend to help the kid to solve that problem. So she had done two things at one time. She was getting a kid to teach another kid. And these are the only voices that kids hear anyway. They don't hear teachers' voices. So she sorted out that end of the problem. She sorted out the tech end of the problem. She is someone I want in every international school in this world because she was able to pick it up and run with it. Uh, so tech is not the problem. It is a long-sighted sort of sociological, repeated learning thing about us which says that facts are better than making mistakes that we have to fight. And that is a battle we fight every day. But if you ask me what tech works the best, I would say that there are two kinds of tech. One is a tech that is very purposefully pointed at the problem. And for us, the purposeful pointing at the problem was to take a lesson or the plan of a lesson and spread it as far as we could go. And we have an app that does exactly that. The other thing is, the other thing we could do with tech is to have it so generic that you that anyone can take the problem like this teacher and massage it to target her particular problem, which is what this teacher did again. You know, so um, you can either have a very targeted tech solution, or you can have a very broad, pliable tech solution. Both these work as long as the tech, um, shall I say, is prefaced by WhatsApp. I mean, I, I, we, we even uh, take the keystrokes. Uh, we are so fascinated by how quickly these teachers use WhatsApp that we use WhatsApp keystrokes on our app so that they would feel it's familiar. So we, we are also learning. Um, now, you know, when, when they take this problem and, we, and they apply it to a real life, they take a solution, they, they apply it to a real life problem, um, let's say in math or physics, we know that they've begun to learn. But when they apply it to social science, we say we all say bravo because that is the toughest one to make an application to in our ecosystem 
And uh, so we're constantly pushing teachers in this direction, giving them all the tech that they can read. And sometimes it's, we can't get the tech out as fast as they want to use it up. So that's, um, we're in a pretty, in a very pretty spot, I have to say. And it looks, it smells like success all the way forward. Nice, nice. So uh, Monica, uh, you know, one is to get uh, STEM education uh, down to girls, technology may have a role to play in it, so on and so forth. But but what's what's the end vision uh, for, for you? What do you want the STEM education to eventually lead to? What's your dream for them? Uh, you know, when it comes to scientific research, academia, you know, that's that's a space which uh, would eventually have, uh, which would eventually have really, really rich dividends, uh, both for the individuals involved and, and the world around them. Do you see a pathway from what you're doing to, uh, to really uh, taking off into high science? And, and uh, do you see the role for technology or any other, uh, any other factors to play, play in there? So uh, globally, we have 28% women uh, participating in STEM careers. And in India, we have 14%. Now imagine that with the technology jobs and the STEM careers increasing and also in line with automation in all the industries we have seen right now, uh, we are not making our kids employable, right? As ma'am was mentioning that we have not changed our education system, but all factory software has been upgraded with the latest Progress. Yeah, so how do we bridge that? So that is where the STEM education comes in place. We have to make sure that children not develop, so technology is going to change. So a child who is going to be there in class six today, wherever is going to go and get a job, the, t the t tech will change. What we want them is to have an approach. An approach where they know that there is the critical thinking, there has to be, there has to be a problem solving attitude. That is what we want them to integrate. And that is where I am trying to work. My organization has been, uh, so we work a lot in tribal areas as well. And when we are teaching tribal area robotics, we uh, actually take it in local language in Gujarati. And for them, uh, the robotics is not having a car. For them, robotics is, can you make a drip irrigation and show it in their farm and just show that how, how is it working? Can you put up sensor-based drip irrigation in their farm? So that is the level of customization they want, especially. So we want them to start thinking that way. So you know what happens in this tribal area, mostly after 12th or 11th, uh, kids come to the major larger cities and start working uh, with the very basic jobs. Now, if we start making sure that these kids in their government schools start getting access to tech and start getting access to STEM technology, they might become a micro entrepreneur, they become an entrepreneur, they can start working remotely and also generate employment in their own ecosystem. And in hence, they will not will have to migrate or even for that case, they will be very much employable. So that is the ultimate vision, right? To give it a 21st century skills to kids in a very fun way so that we make sure that the jobs of tomorrow they're ready for that so that is that is where uh, i see that the work on stem education and the, all the push that has been there from many organizations is going to play a role uh, great monica and actually that in a part uh, also addresses a question that we got uh, from our audience uh, mr raman tripathi his question was everybody's just focusing on quality and quantity uh, but, uh, you know, how do we get students to focus in, in terms of uh, self-explanation, experiential, uh, better understanding rather than just learning by rote or memorizing? Yeah. And, and uh, I think some of the stuff that you spoke about. Yeah. So I can, think accessibility, accessibility to the proper knowledge, accessibility to the tools and proper guidance because the teachers in these areas have to be trained very well have to be paid well so that uh, there is the the gap starts closing down so we need to make sure for this area especially for government schools to increase the accessibility and that has to come through the system right great so Sai, any stories from uh, you know I, I still remember what you said about uh, access to uh, capital jobs uh, employment and, and emotional security 
uh, in the years that you've built Shiro's, does, does any story come to your mind that you want to share with our audience, which really speaks about how uh, how uh, uh, women were able to leverage technology to really drive transformation for themselves? And it doesn't have to be large impact, as Rose said, it could be small impact, but uh, truly life changing. Absolutely. Look, I think uh, Shiro's is now 24 million women on its platform, and I think one of the one of the privileges of building Shiro's is getting to see this happen on an everyday basis. But uh, I think uh, let me let me sort of uh, share a few examples. So so we as part of building the community, uh, we've always run a helpline on our app. It's a chat based free counseling helpline and it's part of our space uh, safe space narrative that hey can if you feel better you can do better and you can you can move faster you can sort of go from there so um and uh, that helpline is counseled about two million women and these women come from like literally locations we every monday as a team we go and plot these locations on the map because we we you know don't know where they exist so it's a fun exercise we get to know the country better but uh, so, for example, once we had this woman reach from a very small village in Tamil Nadu, uh, it was a distress call. Uh, domestic, so a lot of queries also are violence and domestic violence and abuse cases. Uh, and uh, typically we work with partners on the field, but we, we are the first point of call, right? So she calls us and we sort of do the next steps. Uh, so this woman reaches out and saying, hey, my child is nine months old and I'm leaving home. It's 11 o'clock at night. And, and the counselor is just winding up the day and she's like, you know, switching off at 11.30. But, you know, uh, and she hears her out and uh, calls our local partner in Tamil Nadu, uh, gets the woman out of the house to a safety spot. And... Uh, and you know later you know she she undertakes like a beauty parlor course and sort of uh, a lot of things happen uh, and today uh, so this lady runs a community on the platform uh, which is the name of her beauty parlor so she's like the beauty parlor expert now she's also somebody who's taken a loan to buy uh, beauty parlor equipment for her uh, parlor her child has grown but guess what has happened not only she found a safe space, she also found resources later on. I think uh, I keep going back to the fact that once we feel that we're connected to this organization or we're connected to this platform or this community or even just group of five women, I think that's it, right? That I, I know they will cheerlead for me, they will go on. Um, and then of course, uh, we, we uh, in, in COVID, we launched this program called Shiko, which is basically SheCommerce. Uh, the need for incomes went up. And uh, for example, we have this lady Tehseen, who you will see on Twitter uh, really actively now, like from somebody who was not online like two years ago to somebody who's now running an online shop. Uh, so basically what we do is we work with D2C brands and open their inventories and kind of give them a digital storefront where, hey, these are the, so you don't have to invest anything. You don't have to buy a product. There's no physical movement of products happening until an order is generated. But what you get is a lot of products you can put in your digital store. You can make content around it. You can storytell around it and you can start making an income. So the is a homemaker from a place called Hindupur village in, uh, in uh, Andhra. And, uh, She's a 10th graduate. She's never been to college. Uh, two years ago, she got a first smartphone and here she is. She makes like 10,000 bucks a month, you know, all by doing WhatsApp and she knows. And like, so hundreds of these cases, I think almost every day, either uh, sort of, uh, you know, figuring out first to say, oh, I'm not alone. Everyone wants to learn. So learn and earn is a big thing. Uh, when, when I see somebody else do it, then I can also do it. If Satya can do it, then Tahseen can do it. So I think a little bit of that is uh, always, and that's also what keeps us on our toes and you know, makes us sort of do the things that we want to do better. Thanks. And that's a great segue to Rose. Uh, you know, how, how does this whole... Uh, mechanism kind of propagate and is as you said some of the young girls who came as to play football and then they you know grew to become coaches they became leaders they became role models uh, for uh, for others to follow uh, and uh, so any any perspectives on we've spoken a lot about education the role of technology human spirit but there's also this other form of of learning and and grooming and development that uh, something like sports can add 
any any perspectives on what does something which is what we what we don't consider technically as education what does that add to the to the overall uh, development sure so i think there's there's a temptation to look for that one magic low cost key to social development and you'll find different organizations or individuals who re- who will really promote that that one magic key um may it be sports or technology and i think you know after years of of working in this field i think it's critically important that if you are working in this uh, this sector of social development that you're not just thinking what are all the good things that this one tool can do but what are the dangers of it what are the things that can go wrong and then how can i mitigate that risk so for example with sports it, there are many people who who might say well why don't you replicate iwa just you know bring these footballs all around the country how hard is it to make a team you know with a when there's so much um desire among girls all across india to to play um all you need is a a patch of dirt you know just start that team and go but that space can actually become a dangerous space as well uh especially when you're working with a, a population that's already vulnerable so when you're working with young girls if you don't have a coach who's who's responsible who's trained in child safeguarding who knows how to create that um positive environment that safe environment then that can quickly become a really bad situation that might result in an inappropriate relationship that might result in uh in sexual abuse and so at uwa we take different steps to to mitigate that risk primarily by developing young female coaches ourselves for creating pathways to leadership through our program so a girl who starts playing can then become a coach and a role model for others um and then of course you know taking uh taking a lot of time and care in terms of developing our code of conduct and and child protection policy with technology technology can also become uh dangerous especially if we're talking about uh young girls in rural areas or traditional communities um suddenly having access to it so just some some examples that we experienced this year because of course like so many other schools around the world we've been running remotely for the past year and that's been a massive challenge and for our students most of them were sharing devices with family members we were primarily using whatsapp google classroom google meet for classes but in these communities there's great paranoia that girls will have romantic relationships and it's that fear that often results in child marriage and we saw an uptick in that this year fortunately not in our participants but in the villages where we work there was an uptick in child marriages this year uh for a variety of reasons but one of them was this this fear that if the girl is not in school in the foreseeable future there's a chance she's going to have a romance and get married so when a family sees a girl using a phone talking to someone over whatsapp watching a video you know watching a dance uh those fears start start coming up start surfacing and that can be the end of of the girl's future ambitions you know if it results in a marriage so how do you mitigate that risk uh you know there there are different ways to do that one is engaging families um ensuring that especially the men in the home you know if it's the father's phone the older brother's phone that they are very clear about what's going on on the smartphone it's not just about if we're talking about girls using technology it's not just about the girl herself knowing how to use that technology but it's actually about engaging the whole family in order to mitigate the risks that could be associated with uh with the technology got that rose got that uh, great so we've got some questions coming up and uh, i'm going to pick up a couple which have uh, a similar theme we have uh, Tanay Shastri asking uh, Tanay says 2020 has seen an increase in digitization in rural india but affordability and availability of devices still remains a challenge in urban areas as well 
how do we overcome this especially when sharing devices is not possible uh, because of the pandemic uh, he he goes on and asks uh, is upcycling of used devices a solution or is mass subsidy uh, we also have an anonymous uh, attendee who's asked how do we bridge the digital divide for uh, for girls so you know one one line of uh, thinking seems to be if uh, technology can as i said build some bridges create some triggers uh, and uh, open up opportunities how do we build access are there any ideas from uh, from any one of you one idea that i've had for a long time uh, and haven't acted on it simply because i haven't had the time to do this is um it was during the pandemic times that lots of people were so dependent on their devices that they changed to better and better models so they would have returned their old devices to various shops and to various uh, cell phone offices um i think we should go to those offices and say can you just scrub it get it back to showroom uh, you know conditions where memory is concerned we don't care if the things are scratched and so on um and give it back to us and we'll distribute it to whoever doesn't have uh, cell phones and you know we could have a big board saying we are collecting for teachers um your used phone would you uh, you know stand aside from the what 10000 1000 rupees that you'll get back for it uh, when you're going to spend 25 30000 really does do you care like you know could you just give back your give your phones to us and we will make sure that it reaches a teacher so that's one way in which to collect and uh, send back to uh, to teachers and students uh, the use of a phone um a far more difficult one is to actually get good phone habits in you know i mean especially when it's girls and this must uh, really uh, you know resonate uh, with the girl um, girl child with anyone working with girl, girl children is um you you open a chink through which um bad things can happen you know so we have to be able to gather that um and make sure it doesn't impact kids so uh, got it uh, jyoti thanks for that perspective uh, there's another interesting question and i'll pose this to monica uh We, the question reads nowadays most of science practicals based topics is taught online and not done offline can online yeah. learning in higher education institutes especially science practicals uh, and not really knowing how an actual experiment is performed can that guarantee uh, securing future chemical industry job that's very specific internet time uh, practicals online and uh, can be something very unfortunate for an engineering student that chemistry or mechanical experiments are being taught online and we don't have a hands on experience uh, my personal suggestion is that there are a lot of stimulation based websites edtech which are there for freely uh, uh, available on most most of them are from us but chemistry is same everywhere so you can try they have free packages and you can actually uh, make two three formulas and see how the reaction happens it's a stimulation based website maybe you can explore that and uh, keep the spirits high i know this is a tough time and uh, for a job uh, maybe you'll have to put up some extra effort go on a lot of content on youtube practical content on youtube is there a lot of uh, content uh, creators have actually videos like how a reactor works and maybe you can go on that way because your college is just teaching reaction but maybe youtube gives you and free access to practical knowledge and lot of theories but this is an unfortunate time and i am uh, i i i can't guarantee that this is a right thing to do but we don't have an option because health is definitely a larger priority than everything else we are speaking of got it uh amazing uh, i mean i i've uh, uh, learned so much it's just been an amazing uh, experience for me to sit back and and soak uh, uh, soak uh, these really really wonderful and inspiring stories uh thank you so much i don't think i am in a position to really summarize there's just so much uh, 